I'm Femi OK. It has been just over a week since we discovered a new coronavirus variant called Omicron. Here is what we know so far. Let's take a look at a timeline. First discovered November the 24th by South African scientists. Two days later, the WHO designates Omicron as a variant of concern bringing you right up to date. Where are we now? Well, we have confirmed cases in at least 30 countries. So today on the stream, Omicron and vaccine inequity. What is the connection between this variant and some countries not having vaccines to distribute to their citizens? Today's stream. Oh, we have so many experts for you. Dr. Sumya, welcome. Dr. Regina, welcome. Achal, welcome. Good to have you all on the stream. Dr. Sumya, will you introduce yourself to our stream audience? Tell them who you are, what you do. I'm Samya Swaminathan. I'm a pediatrician by training from India, and I currently serve as the chief scientist, the first chief scientist, actually, of the World Health Organization. It's really good to have you. Dr. Regina, welcome back to the stream. Please remind our audience who you are, what you do. Yes, uh, I'm Regina Osi. I'm an infectious disease specialist and I work at the Orem Institute in um, South Africa as the Chief Global Health Officer. And always good to see Acha. I want to call him Acha. I told you so, as he's been following this journey of the pandemic since the very beginning with us on the stream. Acha, though, officially introduce yourself to our stream audience. Go ahead. Lovely to see you, Femi. I'm Achal Prabhala. I work as a public health activist uh, against pharmaceutical monopolies. I've been doing it for 20 years and I work in India, South Africa and Brazil. Good to see you, everybody. I want to tell you that as we're talking about Omicron, it's a new variant. We've only known about it for about a week. What questions do you have? What concerns do you have? Comment sections right here. I will do my best to bring your comments, your concerns to our guests. Samya, let's start with you. What do we know about Omicron in the week that we've known about it? What have we learned? Thank you, Femi. Um, at this point, I think there are more unknowns than knowns. But what we do know, first of all, thanks to the South African scientists and doctors and researchers who picked it up in record time. I mean, I think the first cases that were seen were around the 9th or 10th of November. And by the 24th, they already had several whole genome sequences and had found out that this was a new variant which looked very different from any of the previous variants, very different from Delta, very different from Alpha and Beta. And they also know that and that's why the doctors went in and started investigating because they found about a group of people in an educational institution that had been infected. What we've learned in the last few days is that it does seem to be growing rather rapidly. Um, South Africa is reporting a doubling of cases every other day. Um, at, the, at the moment, a large number of these cases are, are mild uh, infections, but hospital admissions are going up. Mm -hmm. So it looks like this variant is quite transmissible, whether it's more transmissible than Delta or not, needs to be confirmed. It will take a few more days uh, for us to study that. And of course, we know that it's already in every continent in more than 30 countries. And I think it's a question of time when countries start doing their genome sequencing okay. uh, and looking, they'll find more. At All this right. time, we really don't know much about its clinical effects, whether it's different from the previous variants. And we also don't know about whether it can overcome Immunity. But so Dr. Samia, what we do know is about the reaction. We're very clear on the reaction. I want to bring in a new voice into our conversation. This is Vicky Bally. Vicky Bally um, has, has some thoughts about how the world reacted to this new variant. Uh, Regina, I want you to pick right off the back of Vicky's comments. Here she is. Nobody's safe until we're all safe. And I think that really applies when we talk about uh, coronavirus and access to the vaccines, especially with the emerging of all these different variants. And we also know 
for previous variants and hopefully this current variant um, that vaccinated people, even though they might get breakthrough infections that are very mild, um, the infections are also much shorter. So there's a l much shorter time period for the, the virus to actually mutate. So if more people get vaccinated, um, they should, it, this should reduce transmission, but even if there are these breakthrough infections, it won't allow for a generation of as many of these variants coming out. Yes, I, I think that, you know, the reaction in the world was quite disappointing in terms of how we um, approached it. I think that we are two years down the road with this pandemic and that we've learned many, many things in those two years that we need to start applying. And I think one of them is that the tools we have now are not the tools we had in March 2020. I think we have many more, um, you know, sophisticated tests. We've got vaccines. We've got a whole bunch of things that we can use. And we need to be using every tool in our arsenal to be able to really uh, get ahead of the pandemic. And I think going back to sort of knee-jerk reactions in terms of closing down borders and figuring out whether people are allowed to travel or not allowed to travel and sort of going back to sort of the, the early days of the pandemic, I really think does not uh, help anyone. And I think we need to start looking critically at what we've learned in the last two years and what we can all do to really apply the, the, the science that we've learned. And we need to push vaccines. We need to make sure that everybody's vaccinated. But I think, no, as um, Vicky said, nobody is safe and everybody is safe. And it's not everybody for themselves. I think we just have to be a little bit more, uh, have a view to solidarity and have a view to the fact that, you know, so far as we don't deal with the pandemic in um, all of the countries in the world, um, the other countries, the Western countries or the global north is also not going to be safe. Acha, I want to play to you the South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa. This was on November the 28th. He basically calls out countries that immediately put a ban in place for South Africans travelling. Some were stuck. Some were all over the place. And they couldn't get on the plane. They were stuck on the tarmac. This was an instant reaction to a variant that, as Dr. Somya says, we don't even have enough information yet, but yet people were banned. Here is the South African president. Now, these restrictions are completely unjustified and unfairly discriminate against our country and our Southern African sister countries. The prohibition of travel is not informed by science, nor will it be effective in preventing the spread of this variant. The only thing the prohibition on travel will do is to further damage the economies of the affected countries and undermine their ability to respond to, and also to recover from the pandemic. I remember, Femi, last year, the, it was in April, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, along with a few other world leaders, signed a declaration. There were about 150 people on it for a people's vaccine. I was one of the signatories. Uh, my wife said it was world leaders and me. Uh, meaning that I didn't deserve to be there, which is true. But I remember uh, most strikingly, I think, that this is now one and a half years since people warned of vaccine equity. And now we're living in the aftermath of not having vaccine equity. The thing that frightens me about the Omicron variant and the reaction to it is what you're seeing is vaccine inequity deepen in, in two ways. So one is that you've seen across Western countries, high income, rich countries, let's just be use plain language, uh, increasing authorizations of booster shots and encouragements of recommendations to get one. In poor countries, there's a renewed urgency to get vaccinated. And both these forces together create an increasing pressure on having even more vaccines than we thought we needed when we went into the pandemic last year or at the beginning of this year when vaccines came out. And so what we're seeing, I think, as an effect of the Omicron variant is the existing vaccine inequity being further deepened. If you were two doses behind and you live in Nigeria, you are now three doses behind and you'll soon be four doses behind. Uh, many countries who have limited vaccine supplies like India or South Africa don't really have the kind of uh, forward supplies for boosters every six months in the way that some of the recommendations exist today. And my concern really is, where are all these tens of billions of vaccines going to come from? Because they don't exist today. Samia? So, um, April 2020 was also the time when the WHO decided to set up 
COVAX, along with uh, Gavi and CEPI and, and, and many other global institutions, with a view to an end-to-end -end approach, support R&D of new vaccines, ensure that there was procurement and equitable distribution across the world to all countries to first cover the most vulnerable populations uh, in each country before we start scaling up. And that way we could have reduced mortality if only that plan had worked. And it didn't work because there was hoarding of vaccines, there was ordering of vaccines, and uh, neither manufacturers nor the countries with the manufacturing uh, capacity within their borders cooperated with this global plan. And, and as Achal says, I agree that we are at a very dangerous moment now when the panic related to Omicron could start all over again, this hoarding of vaccines and, and not sharing. And COVAX today has delivered about 600 million vaccines. We, we had hoped to be at about 2 billion doses of vaccine out of the door by the end of the year. But that hasn't happened due to all of these uh, other factors. I have heard some horrific stories yeah. of hoarding, Regina. I'm going to get you to jump in because I want you to share some of those stories because people would be shocked at what's going on behind the scenes. For instance, a country like Botswana has a, a delivery of vaccines about to get to them. Somebody else in a richer part of the world bids higher and then those vaccines get taken away from the country that paid higher amounts per vaccine than they were originally being paid for, say, in the global north. That is one story. Regina, I want you to share a couple more so people understand what vaccine inequity really looks like. Before we do that, let me just show you a couple of key points and key stats so that your jaws will drop around the world as you see this. Not our guests, but, but you viewers. 54.6% of the world population has received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. 8.07 billion doses have been administered globally. Only 6% of people in low-income countries have received at least one dose. We are so far behind. Regina, tell us a horror story that you've heard. No, I think, you know, you can, the stats are clearly plainly available. If you go and Google it, you'll find all this information everywhere. There are countries where there have been uh, 220 doses per 100 uh, people sort of um, uh, available and administered. And there are countries where there's been one dose per 100 people. And so, you know, it is really a massive and very stark uh, inequity. I think uh, Dr. Sumia started talking about a little bit about uh, the COVAX mechanism and why that didn't work and people didn't participate. What happens is that people will order, you know, the, the, the it's about purchasing power. It's about uh, amounts of, man of, of, you know, manufacturing uh, <laughs> capacity, supply. Um, and I think that what we have to be really careful about is as well is that this hoarding is going on with the vaccines, but we are just about to get two potentially game-changing antivirals uh, that are coming down the pipeline to try to help, um, you know, stop the progression of uh, mild, moderate um, uh, COVID um, to severe COVID um, in people with risk factors. And I think that we're going to have a risk of that same thing happening with these antivirals that are being uh, produced. First of all, the manufacturing capacity is not there to take care of everybody. So it's going to go to people who can, you know, have better ne negotiations, have better purchasing power, uh, the pooled procurement that is happening sort of through different uh, global mechanisms. Uh, people are just not really playing uh, fair with that either. And so it's going to end up in a situation where on top of being vaccinated, people in the global north will have access to very cutting edge therapeutics that people who are unvaccinated and therefore at higher risk of uh, dying and having severe disease from COVID will not have access to. And I think it's just going to perpetrate this inequity that is already really quite stark. I have so many questions for you on YouTube guests. I'm going to fire a couple at you. We're going to do this as a rapid fire round because then we're going to get to what you feel we should be doing now as an international community. A couple of questions for you. Very quickly, I'm going to ask you. Uh, Moses, Samia, I'm going to put this one to you. Moses wants to know, do existing vaccines work on Omicron? So existing vaccines work against all of the other variants. And, you know, we have to remind ourselves it's a Delta variant globally today that's accounting for 99% of infections. And vaccines prevent severe disease hospitalizations and death, they modify the disease. They don't entirely prevent infections. 
We, we think that these vaccines will still work against Omicron and other variants because they elicit a very broad immune response in the body. Is that going to be reduced or not? Those experiments are still in progress, but we do think they will have some protection. Okay. And that people being vaccinated will be better than not, not having the vaccine at all. Good question, Moses. Mashoud has a question. Regina, I'm going to put this one to you. What would be the scientific solution for a constantly mutating virus? Oh, that's a complicated one. <laughs> I think the scientists have been uh, sort of doing their heads in with that as well. I think the idea is to find, um, you know, therapeutics that are um, that are widely neutralized, neutralizing. So antivirals or actually vaccines that are actually going to be able to deal with several um, sort of are working against the epitopes or the, the areas that are common across many different viruses. So you would have less concern in terms of, you know, mutation of the spike protein. But it's kind of natural in terms of the scientific basis that once you have something that works, um, the viruses that are not affected by that thing tend to then propagate. And so the real scientific solution is to get everybody vaccinated, reduce transmission, reduce the amount of disease that's circulating. And so you get to the point where you don't actually have um, enough viral uh, replication to be able to transmit uh, mutant viruses. So it, it is a multifactorial thing. It's not going to be just one silver bullet. But, you know, I think people are working on all fronts. Lots of ideas circulating on YouTube as well. This one from Avinash Gupta. Avinash says, I'm going to put this to you, Achal. I like the model from Indian airports where they have passengers with a negative test before departure and these passengers are tested again on arrival irrespective of the test status. Could that be the future for all of us, for all travel during our pandemic? You know, one of the things that's really arbitrary about the travel bans is that they're not implementing good testing in order to be able to have people move as they need to uh, without being inconvenienced uh, by these arbitrary bans. But can I just say that mm. I think what it leads to is this idea, uh, especially in Southern Africa, but also in Western and, and Eastern Africa, parts of Central Africa, that the countries who have had the least amount of access to vaccines in this entire pandemic uh, among the countries who are being punished the most for then uh, supposedly perhaps uh, originating or, 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 or detecting a variant uh, in the region. And I think that part of it is something we, we need to be really concerned about. Regina talked about antiviral pills from Merck and from Pfizer. The Merck pill works less well, it turns out, than we thought it would. The Pfizer pill, we hope, might work as well as they say it will. These pills actually have much better access provisions than vaccines. So between 95 and 105 countries around the world, many low-income countries, including India and South Africa, will have access to these pills through an arrangement with the medicines patent pool because these companies have allowed it. The reason the same company, for instance, like Pfizer, is not doing the same thing for its vaccine, which it could feasibly also do to other companies to have them manufacture them at the same time, is because they have a monopoly control over those vaccines beyond intellectual property, that there is no law on earth in countries or otherwise that can get them to part with it. And so they understand that. And they're keeping these vaccine technologies close, uh, disallowing in many ways uh, the just full production of these vaccines that we could have, which to the extent that they happen would would remove the unnecessary and ridiculous barriers that arbitrary travels, travel bans like the one that we're experiencing uh, cause. I hear the frustration in your voice, Achal. Is an, is an Omicron variant with, with um, such a speedy ability to transmit coronavirus, uh, as far as we know right now, is that, is that the tipping point? Is that when we just say, OK, we need to work together, we need to pull our ideas? Are, are we at that point yet? Because it's over know, two I, years. Yeah. I find it really, uh, uh, you know, sometimes ridiculous. I know you don't mean it that way when people yeah. use the word tipping point. I yeah. lived through Bangalore in April and May and June. Yeah. We had officially 4,500 people a day dying in June, unofficially anywhere between two and five times that number dying a day. Was that not a tipping point? You know, was the Brazilian variant that was uh, uh, proliferating in towns like Manaus and uh, uh, wreaking destruction there, was that not a tipping point? You know, was the UK variant prior to vaccinations even being 
uh, brought to market, was that not a tipping point? I mean, this has been tipping point upon tipping point upon tipping point, right? Yeah. And so for anyone to think that now is the time to wake up, I'm very sorry, but the time to wake up was exactly in March 2020 when the WHO declared the pandemic officially uh, exists. All right, so what should we do? Um, I am calling this gangster science, Regina. I know it's not called gangster science. It's um, reverse engineering, okay? So you take the vaccine and then you work out how it was put together and then you make your own vaccine. Um, this is Karen Fenner from Afrogen, who is doing this science in South Africa. Maybe if we're able to do reverse engineering, in the developing world, we're not going to be quite so reliant on what happens from the rich world. Here she is. There's a lot that we've learned in the pandemic and, it, and it's highlighted just the inequities that, that exist. Um, but it's also given such a driving force to say, um, for Africa to say, no, we can do it. It's like we, um, there's major emerging economies, it's a growing continent and um, we can do it. Gina. Uh, yes, I mean, I think she's right. Yes, we can do it. But the question is, how much time do we have, right? And I think that, you know, a lot of um, the development that was done by BioNTech, Pfizer, and all of the big, uh, and Moderna in terms of the vaccine was also funded through some public funds. Uh, people have stood in line to sort of pay for vaccines, but even then we're still not able to get them. And, you know, yes, why would we have to then reverse engineer when there are tech transfer provisions that can be had that's going to take an inordinate amount of time and resources when the actual technology already exists, has been elaborated, and uh, then um, is just being held basically hostage so that we have to then um, do everything from scratch. And I think that, you know, it's also not even as if we're asking for something that is, you know, proprietary in the terms that, you know, it's not really for the common good, but everybody in the world is going to keep suffering from the COVID pandemic if we do not get vaccines to everybody and get everybody vaccinated and really mm -hmm. start sharing that technology. And so the logic of that sort of really defies me a little bit. Earlier on the stream, we spoke to uh, Dr. Sami, I'm going to come right to you. Uh, earlier on the stream, we spoke to Dr. Harsha Samaru. She is a public health medicine specialist. And her message to us was, we need to be more sophisticated about how we're dealing with the pandemic. Dr. Sami, as soon as she's finished, I would love to hear what you feel your message from the WHO as chief scientist should be to us as international viewers watching right now. Here is Harsha Samaru, first of all. In December 2021, as opposed to two years ago, travel bans in response to a newly detected COVID-19 variant are scientifically questionable and quite naive. I certainly agree that governments need to do all that they can to prevent the entry of new cases and variants into the countries, and this can be achieved by mandating various public health measures, including ensuring that travelers are vaccinated that um, they produce a negative COVID-19 test prior to departure, that they're screening and mask wearing for the duration of travel, and that quarantine is instituted at the destination country. Mm. Dr. Samya, what's the message you want to leave us with as a chief scientist at the WHO? What we've observed over the last two years, Femi, is that science produces and produce the vaccines, the monoclonal antibodies, the drugs, the diagnostics. But there was no solidarity. There was no global collaboration. And vaccines and other products which save lives, you know, we've lost over 5 million people. Those are just the known cases, probably real number much, much higher than that. These are global public goods. And as Regina said, many of the early research that goes into the development of these products is funded by government, is, is taxpayer money that goes into that research. And later on, it's acquired by companies that then produce uh, vaccines and drugs. And uh, we need a model, a new model. And I hope that the pandemic treaty that's now being negotiated by the member states of the World Health Organization will take this opportunity to put in place mechanisms, processes, guardrails, at least for the future, for future generations, if there's a pandemic again, that we need to develop products which are then equitably uh, distributed. And for this pandemic, we've started work with this uh, technology transfer hubs. You mentioned the one in South Africa, which is trying to 
build capacity to make mRNA vaccines and train teams Thank you coming from so much, Dr. Samia, for bringing your wisdom, your insight to us on the stream. Dr. Regina, thank you as well. And Acho, it's always a pleasure having you. Let me leave you here on my laptop with the WHO a homepage here, and you can see all of the information about the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic, including the new variant. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.